Policymakers will gather in Washington, D.C. next week for the annual IMF World Bank Spring Meetings. IMF Managing Director Kristalina Gorgieva says, Gorgieva rather, says the meetings come at a sensitive time for the global economy. Jim Spellman reports. In a preview speech, the IMF Managing Director says next week's spring meetings come at a crucial time for the global economy, that policy decisions made now will determine how history judges this decade. Will it go down in history as the turbulent 20s, a time of disruptance and uh, divergence in economic fortunes, uh, or the tepid 20s, a time of slow growth and popular discontent, or the transformational 20s, a time of rapid technological advancements for the good of humanity? The release of the World Economic Outlook is a key part of each year's spring meetings. The managing director said this year's outlook will show marginally stronger global growth. That's mostly credited to an increase in consumption and business investments, plus the easing of supply chain disruptions. And strong labor markets, driven in part by immigration, have helped maintain economic resilience. She anticipates cooling inflation will likely set the stage for central bank rate cuts in the second half of the year, but warns against cutting rates too fast. She notes that global economic activity is low compared to other eras and warns that many challenges remain. Prospects for growth have been slowing since the global financial crisis. Just look at this graph. And inflation is not fully defeated. Fiscal buffers, on the other hand, have been depleted. And debt is up, posing a major challenge to public finances in many countries. The managing director also warned of the hazards of protectionism, warning that geopolitical tensions risk the fragmentation of important economies. And that fragmentation could create a drag on the entire global economy. Jim Spellman, CGTN, Washington. For more insight into what we can expect from this year's spring meetings, let's bring in Yan Liang. She's a cha chair professor in economics at Wallama University in the U.S. state of Oregon. Uh, Yan Liang, great to have you back on the program. Always good to see you. Let's talk good about talk to you, Sean. key topics that are going to be discussed at the World Bank IMF spring meetings uh, this year. Always uh, such an important time and so much attention, obviously, focused on all of this. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, the concerns over inflation, the economic impact of the wars in Gaza and also Ukraine, and now the new tension between, you know, Iran and uh, Israel, as well as, you know, the impact of AI and other technologies on the growth, uh, the world economy. I think these are at the front and center um, of the policymakers um, when they meet. Um, so they're going to talk about a variety of policy priorities, uh, ranging from how to achieve price stability to rebuild fiscal buffers, um, also to promote, you know, green and digital transitions, as well as, you know, I think very importantly, how to overcome, you know, geopolitical differences and tensions and foster more cooperation around the world to deal with all these challenges. And let's talk about uh, the financial markets and the global economy, how it is going to react uh, to these meetings as well, because we have inflation, we have possible uh, deflation. As you mentioned, we have all the geopolitical activity going on uh, in Ukraine and Russia, as well as the Middle East. So there is a great deal to digest and so many people looking for the information that's going to come out of these meetings. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, this is a very important meeting because I think in many ways it will help to guide the policy makings um, in the coming years, um, months and years. So I think, you know, these are all very important concerns, um, as, you know, the IMF general director has just mentioned. Mm. You know, when it comes to inflation, um, that has a lot to do with, you know, how inflation is going to be sticky or is going to see more progress towards the, you know, more stable level. Um, the emerging markets are still having, you know, 4.1 percent of inflation rate as of last quarter. Um, there are also many, you know, as you mentioned, uh, some of these geopolitical uncertainties that could elevate inflation, uh, inflationary pressure. And also with the high and long, uh, longer uh, interest rates, I think that also matters a lot when it comes to, you know, developing countries' debt crises, especially in the low-income countries, and also how to um, come up with finance um, for, you know, climate transition and climate mitigation efforts. Um, and when it comes to also, you know, physical spending, physical buffers, 
um, as well as, you know, the corporations when it comes to, you know, how to promote economic growth around the globe instead of resorting to profession, uh, protectionism. So I think all these are very important um, policy uh, potential changes, and that would really, you know, shift the global economy um, as well as, you know, the financial markets. Now, you outlined a number of concerns. So what are the expected outcomes of all these meetings? They have to digest all that information you just talked about. Right. So I think, unfortunately, um, I think we are quite, um, I mean, personally, I think I'm expecting not too much. Um, you know, I think this this meeting could be still, you know, relatively underwhelming um, for varieties of reasons. I think, you know, a lot of these geopolitical tensions and also regional conflicts um, are not something that you could simply resolve um, at, a, at a meeting uh, like this. Um, not to mention, I think there are still a lot of areas where the IMF and the World Bank need to reform and need to, you know, uh, make some improvements in the first place. Um, for example, you know, developing countries are still very much underrepresented Absolutely. in uh, international organizations. Um, you know, the developed world has only about 14 percent of their population and 41 percent of world GDP, but they have more than 59 percent of the voting shares. Um, also, I think, you know, these two institutions are still quite slow in terms of supporting uh, climate finance. Um, when you look at World Bank, you know, out of the 33 billion green loans, the developing countries account for only a meager 4.8 percent. Um, so I think there's a lot um, still um, that needs to be reformed at these institutions uh, before they can take a really meaningful leadership um, in steering, you know, global policymaking and growth. You know, that word you use, underwhelming, I've uh, read that a couple of times. When you have organizations this big, this large, if they do anything significant, it could have earth-rattling implications. So clearly, uh, they tend to steer toward what you talked about, the more broad type of discussions that stay away from some of the real sticking points. And you talked about that with the uh, developing nations. Uh, let's go more into that and talk about where the World Bank and IMF, for lack of a better term, are failing these entities. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, there are two major flaws or major failures. One, as I mentioned, is the sovereign debt crisis in the low income, you know, countries. And uh, many of these uh, low income countries are now spending 14% of their government revenues just to pay external uh, debt interest payments. And so that means they're not going to be able to spend, you know, much on their health care, on education, or, you know, climate mitigations. So I think this is a very uh, difficult situation for them. And yet, I think the sovereign, you know, debt round table um, has made very slow progress. And now, finally, I think Zambia uh, just had, a, you know, negotiations with external debtors, uh, creditors. Uh, but I think that is far from sufficient. Yeah. And the second major problem, like I mentioned, is really the lack of uh, climate finance. Uh, and we're almost out of time, but I really want to ask you, we talked a great deal about the developing nations. Let's talk about the world's two largest economies. What do you expect these entities to say about these two uh, countries that simply haven't been getting along despite recent efforts to try and find some kind of uh, area that they all that they both agree on. Right. So I think this is a thorny issue. I think, you know, with the climate change and with the sluggish, you know, global economy and with all these challenges, I think, you know, China and the United States should really work together. Um, but based on the recent, uh, you know, trip of uh, Janet Yellen, the Secretary of Treasury, I think there are positive signs that, you know, the communications has been increased and improved. But at the same time, I think both still have very fundamental differences when it comes to, you know, how to implement industrial policies, how to cooperate uh, in, you know, global global financial uh, arena and also how to coordinate policies as well as, you know, prepare or um, invest in the climate change uh, kind of mitigations in terms of, you know, green technology and green products. I think it's quite upsetting and I, to me is disappointing um, that, you know, this overcapacity issue has been emphasized right. during the trip when we really need work together to promote the, the green technology and green products um, to accelerate energy transitions and really to fight, you know, climate change.